Okay, the Spirit and the cross, the work of the Holy Spirit in the process of salvation. And today's lesson is entitled God Word and Man Word Manifestation, lesson number three in the series. So, so far in our study of the Holy Spirit, we've learned the following key ideas concerning Him. First of all, the Bible is the only reliable source of information about Him. We said that was a kind of a basic ground rule. Uh, the idea is that there is no further information uh, available concerning the Holy Spirit that has been released. Nobody today can tell us something new about the Holy Spirit, it's not already contained in the scripture. We um, read uh, Jude uh, 3. Jude writes, beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. Fight, fight for the faith. And I said to you last week, the faith, meaning the body of doctrine, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Once for all says there is no more, no new revelation that's, that's coming out. And then the third thing we talked about was that the Holy Spirit is a distinct person in the Godhead. He possesses all the attributes of God. He is God and not a personality of God or a third ranking deity, you know, after the Father, the Son, then you've got the Holy Spirit you know, trailing behind there. You know, that's not the idea. So in this lesson today, we're going to focus on specific character traits and abilities the Bible attributes to the persons of the Godhead, all the persons of the Godhead. So a common question is the following. Is there anything that the Father or the Son can do that the Holy Spirit you know, is not or cannot do? And many people suggest that the Holy Spirit has a, a character that is different somehow from the Father, and the, uh, the Father and the Son. This idea is held because these people fail to recognize and consider the twofold nature of uh, godly relationships. Important point coming up. There is the Godward manifestation or the Godward relationship as the Godhead relates and interacts within itself. As the Father, the Son, the Spirit interact within themselves, the Godward relationship. And then there's the manward relationship as the Godhead relates and interacts with mankind. So two, two relationships. We have to sort of keep that in mind as we study this topic. So let's talk first of all about the Godward relationship. When interacting or relating within the Godhead, the Holy Spirit possesses every characteristic, power and ability as the other persons in the Godhead. This simple chart that I'm going to show you demonstrates this fact by providing passages that describe and support this idea of similar and equal facets of each person's character and abilities, again, according to the Bible. So we begin, here's the chart. So we look at the Father, here you have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and then you have the characteristics, the power and the uh, revelation. So we're not going to read all of these, but just a few, just to give you an idea of how the, the chart works. So let's say we look at the Father, uh, and one of the characteristics of the Father is that He's eternal. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter uh, 33, verse 27, it says, the eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms as He drove out the enemy from before you, and He said, destroy. The eternal God, God the Father, there relating to in this, uh, in this passage. And then in the chart, you have the son. Well, he's eternal as well. Hebrews 13, eight, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. So the son is eternal. And then if we look at the Holy Spirit, 
Hebrews 9.14 says, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So uh, the, is the father eternal in nature? Yes. And the son? Oh, absolutely. And the Holy Spirit? Yes. Who says so? Well, the scriptures say so in referring to each of them individually. Another characteristic, the father is loving, is he not? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You know, the father is loving. It's a characteristic of, of his. What about the son? Is he loving? Yes, in John 13, 1, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. Well, Jesus is loving. I mean, we know this, but you know, someone says, well, have you got a scripture? Sure, here's one. What about the Holy Spirit? It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Well, <laughs> how can you produce love if you yourself you know, do not possess love? So the Spirit is loving as well. Another one, holy, another characteristic. I'm in that, you know, that chart there where it says characteristics. One of the characteristics of the Godhead, the Father is holy, first Peter, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. God is speaking. Is the Son holy? It says, let us alone. What business do we have with each other? Jesus of Nazareth, these are the demons talking to him. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of Israel. Is the Son holy? Absolutely. What about the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's an easy one. I mean, his name is the Holy Spirit. You know, is he holy? Well, yeah, of course. If you were to go on to you know, another, uh, I'll go, there we go, we go back to the chart here. You could go on, I don't want to use up the whole lesson just doing, you know, hammering home this idea, but you could go on, you know, the father has uh, the, the power uh, to create and to destroy, but so does the son create and destroy, and so does the Holy Spirit create and destroy. They have each those powers. And as far as revelation uh, is uh, concerned, uh, the father speaks, Matthew 17, uh, 17 5, uh, the son speaks as a glorified person in the Godhead. And the Holy Spirit also uh, speaks, 1 Timothy uh, chapter four. So we could read all the passages that reinforce the idea that each one of the persons in the Godhead have similar characteristics. So when comparing the three persons in the Godhead, we notice two things in particular. First, from their Godward position and their relationship, all three persons have the same character, holy and loving. They have the same power to create and to destroy, and they, and they all have the revelational skills and ability to communicate. The Father communicates, the Son communicates, but the Holy Spirit communicates as well. However, we do observe that they each communicate in different ways with mankind. For example, the father uh, communicates through theophanies. He was a voice in Genesis, the burning bush in Exodus, natural phenomenon on, on Mount Sinai, right? Thunder, lightning, you know, roaring, sound. He communicates. But the son also communicates, right? He, the son becomes a man, the God made man. And so he communicates directly with man as man, as a man. And the Holy Spirit also communicates. Well, yeah, 
We're, we're using his medium of communication here this morning in order to learn about these things. He communicates because he has produced the word through various uh, individuals throughout history, the inspired word spoken and read. So each person of the Godhead, equal in every way, but communicates with mankind in a different way, in their own particular fashion. So when therefore we see and hear Jesus, well, we see and hear the Father and we see the Holy Spirit also, since all three are one, possessing the same character and power. You know that passage, 14, John 14? Philip says to him, meaning Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been so long, have I been so long? Have I been so long with you and yet you have not, no, you have not come to know me, Philip? Who's talking here? The Father is saying directly to Philip. He who has seen me, Jesus says, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? The other thing we notice when comparing uh, the persons in the Godhead is that they appear when we examine the relationship between God and man in the process of salvation. Not when we examine the relationship between the persons and the Godhead. In other words, the differences that we notice when we're reading in the Bible about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are not when we examine the three persons as they are in the Godhead interacting within themselves. We notice the difference when they interact with us. Then we see a difference. So we're not going to you know, proceed with our study by listing a long list of scriptures that define the various qualities of the Holy Spirit from which we can assemble a clear image of what He is like. If we wish to see the Spirit with our fleshly eyes, then we should do as Jesus said and look at Jesus, since in Him is revealed not only the Father, but the Spirit as well, since they're one in the Godhead. As I mentioned before, it's not in the Godward relationship that we see a difference between the persons of the Godhead, especially the Holy Spirit. It's in the relationship with man that the work and the differences between them appear. So let's review the various stages of the God-man relationship throughout history and see how these reveal each person in the Godhead in the process of salvation. So we've talked about the Godward relationship, you know, in the chart, they're all the same. They all have the same power, the same, you know, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We've looked at the chart. That's the Godward relationship. Now we're going to look at the manward relationship as God relates to mankind. So the first stage in the manward relationship of the Godhead or the Trinity and mankind, humanity, is the pre-sin or pre-fall relationship. So the relationship between God and man seen differently by man before the fall. Before the fall, all three existed. Right, Genesis 1, 1 to 3, this is before the fall. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. And the darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. So the Hebrew word Elohim is used here, which is plural, the gods. And so we see all three exercise their power. I read in uh, Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing 
that creeps on the earth. So all three exercise their power. God refers to himself in the plural. Remember now, this is how did man see or how can we see you know, God's appearance before the fall of man? Well, we see you know, as the Godhead, all working together. All three communicate their distinct, their distinct uh, presence. And I go back to Genesis uh, uh, 1, 1 to 3 to go back over that again. So in this passage, God the Father spoke. God the Son, the Word, created through the Word, everything was created. And God the Holy Spirit hovered or moved. Uh, in English, a more precise translation, vibrated, vibrated in order to bring together the created elements into a distinct forms, okay? So before sin, man had a comprehensive, unified, peaceful relationship with the Godhead. In other words, man saw God as one, even though God's dynamic nature existed. I'll give you another passage. Genesis 3.8 says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Bible suggests that before sin, God could walk in the garden in the cool of the day, a description highlighting the nature of man's relationship with God before sin. In other words, Man related to God in his unified state. Father, Son, Holy Spirit together. Okay. Now, something happened. Sin happened. And so you have the post sin or fall relationship that man has with God. Different now. And also, the way that man sees God different. So man's disobedience set several events and plans into motion. A long passage, but it explains better than I could try to paraphrase. So let's just read it together. It says, then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall uh, return. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. 
So he drove the men out and at the, end, uh, and at the east of the uh, Garden of Eden, uh, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Long passage that pretty much describes you know, the history of why we are where we are today. So you notice a couple of things here. There is the curse on Satan in verse 14. There is the prophecy concerning his futile attempts to destroy both mankind as well as the savior of mankind in verse 15. There is the suffering of mankind to both propagate and sustain the human race, verses 16 to 19. Then the broken relationship with God where God would no longer have a unified, peaceful connection with man, but because of sin, man's vision and his experience of God would be diminished and distorted, verses 20 to 24. Now part of these changes mentioned cryptically in verse 15 is that God would initiate a plan to save man from both the corruption and the condemnation of sin and return man to a unified and intimate relationship with himself once again. Now we're able to discern that because we're now here today after that plan has been executed but there is still the seed of that idea planted right there uh, in verse uh, 15. You know, uh, the seed of the woman, uh, you know, that the Satan would uh, uh, bruise the seed of the woman's heel uh, and the seed would uh, you know, bruise his head, uh, meaning that, uh, you know, that uh, he, he, would, he would be able to, uh, uh, to harm the seed, Jesus, uh, stop him for a time, you know, a partial wound on the heel. Yes, he died, but only uh, you know, for several days was he buried. You know, it was only partial, the damage. But the damage to Satan was complete. You know, his, his, his wound would be to his head, meaning it would be a fatal blow that the seed would uh, uh, visit upon Satan. And so in the working out of this plan, however, the persons in the Godhead would each have a task and would function differently than they had up until this point. It is in their different functions that we see or we note a distinction within the Godhead. That's where we see the difference. How they act in carrying out the plan to save mankind is how we see a difference. All right. So it's important to remember that the difference we see is in function, not nature. Function, how they functioned, not how they are. They are still the same as they are you know, within the Godhead, all the same powers, same characteristics, so on and so forth. You know. So nature remains the same, but function is now uh, visible to us we begin to see them functioning in a different way. So uh, the natures are divine, the functions vary due to the requirements of the plan to save mankind. So we jump forward to a passage in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 15, 24a, where uh, Paul says, then comes the end, he's talking about the end of the world, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to uh, the God and Father, he mean, meaning Jesus. And so Paul here suggests that when Jesus returns to judge, these functions will no longer be required and thus will cease to be observed. And the Godhead will return to its pre-sin unified nature with man, part of the Godhead within, no longer observing from the outside, but part of the Godhead within another passage, 2 Timothy 11 and 12. Paul says it's a trustworthy statement for if we died with him, well, in that term, you know, he's talking about the, the entire 
plan of salvation. We die with him, we die with Jesus. Where do we die with Jesus? Well, we're buried with him in baptism, right? And we resurrect to a new life. So he compresses that, all of that information into this little phrase here, for if we died with him, okay? In other words, if you're saved, if you're, you know, if you're a member of the church, the kingdom, if we died with him, we will also live with him. Well, yeah, we know that, you know, new life, eternal life, yeah, but here's the point. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Well, where does Jesus reign? Well, at the right hand of the Father. So we will reign with him. If he's at the right hand of the Father and we're with him, where will we be? We'll be with him at the right hand of the Father. Well, where exactly is that? That's in the Godhead. That, that's the end game, brothers and sisters. That's the, that's the, you know, well, well, how does it all end? Well, that's how it all ends. We'll talk more about that. Just giving you, you know, the big picture now, for now. So, functions of the Godhead in the God-man post sinfall relationship to better see what the Holy Spirit is like. It's a long sentence, but that's what we're doing. In the plan to save mankind, each person in the Godhead had a part to play, and we are able to identify each as they reveal themselves through the parts that they play in the plan of salvation. So, in this plan, the Father's role, what is the Father's role? What is his function? Well, he chooses the plan. He designs the manner that justice for sin and mercy for sinful man will be realized. Again, I go back to Genesis 3.14. He says, the Lord God said to the serpent, okay, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed, singular, and her seed, singular. And he shall bruise you on the head. He, of course, we know is Jesus. You, the devil, on the head is a major wound. And you shall bruise him on the heel, which is a minor wound, something you can recover from. And so God the Father chooses the plan. He designs the manner that justice for sin and mercy for sinful man, these two things will be realized. And what is the plan? The plan is vicarious atonement. That's the plan. That's the plan that was designed. In God's plan, the innocent will be sacrificed to pay the moral debt for the guilty. That's the plan of salvation. In Romans chapter five, verse six, eight, Paul says, for while we were still helpless, right? Sinful, condemned. At the right time, meaning the right time in history, Christ died for the ungodly, the innocent for the guilty, vicarious atonement. For one will hardly, then he explains it, for one will hardly die for a righteous man, though for perhaps the good man, someone would even dare to die. In other words, you know, I'll die to save you. you know, a good man might do that, but he said, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, while we hated him, he was sending his son to die for us, vicarious atonement. And so the father chooses the plan and the father also chooses and sends the son to become that innocent human sacrifice who will die to pay the sins of man. John 3, 16, right? The golden passage, for God so loved the world. Okay, what did he do that he so loved the world? Well, that he gave his only begotten son, only begotten, only one of a kind, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal, uh, eternal life. So the father chooses the plan. How are we going to do this? You know? Maybe we'll save him by law. 
hey, how about we, you know, we set down uh, you know, a bunch of commandments and all the people who obey those commandments, they're in, they're good, they're going to heaven. And all the people who don't obey them, you know, that's a good way, why, why not that plan? Or how about, well, how about we, let's just forget it. Let's just forgive everybody. You know, let's just, you know, it's a whole mess. You know, it's a big mess. Let's just forgive everybody. Everybody goes to heaven. Come on, let's go. Adolf, come on in, buddy. You know. Are we going to use that plan? No. No, we're going to use vicarious atonement. Why? Because it satisfies God's demand for justice. Sin must be atoned for. And at the same time, it satisfies God's uh, merciful nature of love. Instead of subjecting man to this eternal punishment, this death, spiritual death, he sends his son to do it vicariously. That's what it means, on our behalf. That's the plan. We have several plans, but this is the plan that the father chose to put into action. That's what he chose. And he chose his son to be the one to carry out the plan, okay? Now, God the Son, what's He do? What's His role in this? Well, God the Son actualizes and fulfills God the Father's plan, which is vicarious atonement, to save man from condemnation and spiritual death caused by sin. In Hebrews 2 verse 9, the writer says, but we do see Him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. You, me, for everyone, he might taste death. Just another way to describe vicarious atonement. So the son actualizes the plan. God the Son takes on human flesh, lives a life without sin, and submits to a sacrificial death on the cross to pay the sin debt that all men owed to God. Let's go back to the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, five. Isaiah the prophet, in speaking of the one to come, says, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. He has said the same thing four times. And what has he said? Vicarious atonement. And what is so amazing about this is that 700 years before it actually took place, he describes in intimately exactly what the plan was going to be. This is why our Jewish friends rarely have a, an answer for Isaiah 53 when you present that to them as you know, proof that the prophets spoke of Jesus. No one else you know, fulfilled this prophecy. No other character could have fulfilled this. Uh, prophecy. So the fact that he was innocent made him a worthy sacrifice. The fact that he had a divine nature made his sacrifice valuable enough to pay for all the sins of all mankind from Adam to the last man alive at the end of the world. I've often you know, used the example, let's say I managed to live a perfect life, let's just say. And God said, all right, you've lived a perfect life, good for you. You can, if you want, you can offer this life to me you know, in exchange for another life. Who do you choose? You know? Cause you've got one life and it's perfect. I'll accept it as payment for moral debt for someone else. Who do you choose? Julia, Paul, you know? <laughs> Lise, who do you choose? But you only get one choice, why? Because after all, it's just a human life. One human life for another human life. But Jesus is the son of God. He has a divine life. 
So not only was he able to offer his perfect life, but because he's divine, his perfect life is worth every single human life from Adam to the, to the end of time. So we read in Hebrews 10, 11, 12, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sin, but he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, why for all time? Because he's eternal sat down at the right hand of God. And so, we have God the Father as the initiator. He chooses the plan, which is vicarious atonement. And he chooses and sends the Son to reveal and fulfill that plan. This is the basis of the biblical doctrine of election. Not that God chooses some people for salvation and others for destruction but that the father chooses or elects the son to carry out the plan. This is the only choice that the father makes. Those who believe in the chosen or elected son themselves become the elect of God. For example, we vote for someone during the elections and if they win, we say, hey, we won our elections, why? In other words, we win if they win, right? Well, in the same way, Jesus is the chosen or the elected one by God, and those who choose him by faith, expressed in repentance and baptism, they become the elect or the chosen ones by faith. So let's summarize so we can get this in on time here. Here are some of the ideas discussed in this lesson. First, the persons in the Godhead or the Trinity all have the same spiritual divine nature and abilities. Uh, and of course, we recognize that in the chart that I showed you. On an historical note, we said that Tertullian, a third century Latin theologian, was the first to use this term Trinity in referring uh, to the Godhead. Secondly, we don't see any difference in their Godward presence and only have brief indications of their dynamic and complex nature. For example, the use of the plural word to describe God in Genesis, Elohim, is a suggestion that there's a dynamic nature happening there in, in the Godhead. And then the third thing, the separate persons are actually revealed as God's plan of salvation is made known. God the Father, for example, chooses the plan and chooses the Son to reveal and carry out the plan. God the Son reveals the plan and fulfills the plan. We have to stop there, but next week we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. What is the role of the Holy Spirit in the plan of salvation? And that's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>